There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped at 10th and Grant's microvisor. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. everyone and welcome to police off the cuff real crime stories i'm your host retired nypd sergeant bill cannon a 27 year veteran of the nypd i'm so excited about tonight's show not only do we have one fbi agent on we have two fbi agents i could see they're not wearing their fbi hat you know i'm i'm, I'm flying my colors but they're, they're here they're two great guys and they're actually you know like all fbi agents they hooked themselves up after their career, and they're all in the TV biz now. I don't know how that happens, but these guys are unbelievable guests. Anyway, what we're going to talk about tonight is equally as exciting. I don't know how I became Crazy Eddie from that advertising from years ago. But anyway, the show tonight, we're going to talk about profiling, and specifically in, in regards to Rex Ewerman, the Long Island serial killer. And we couldn't have any better people on, not only... Do they walk the walk, but they talk the talk. And they not only they talk the talk, they write about this stuff too. So they obviously know what they are talking about. In fact, an article in the New York Times, I believe it was in 2011, predicting what the uh, Gilgo Beach serial killer would be like, practically hit it exactly on the head. And I'm going to let uh, Jim Clemente talk about that when I bring him on. And of course, we have Bobby Chacon also. But let me bring him on one at a time because... It's not just me tonight. We have a crowd favorite, NYPD, retired sergeant, professor of criminal justice, law degree. In fact, I'm the only guy on the show tonight without a law degree. I, I'm, I'm the dumbest guy on the show tonight. All three of these guys have law degrees. I feel like so inferior. Like, what was I doing all those years? I was I was in the gin mill while these guys were studying their law books. Anyway, let me be Mike Geary. How you doing, Mike? Hey, Billy. Good evening. Good to see you. Thank you for having me on. It's great to have you here. And you know something? We got, we got two feds. They call them feds, you know? And, uh, oh, the feds. But oh, my and, you know, one of the things, uh, sort of like Bobby Chacon is sort of like Paisan. You know why? Because his dad was an NYPD sergeant and his brother was an NYPD sergeant. And he's a Long Island boy from West Islip. So I have to, I have to love the guy, right? But first, let me bring on his buddy who we brought in at the last moment when Dr. Joni Johnston, just a little touch of laryngitis, and she bagged out, and I said, Dr. Joni, that's okay. I got two really good guests. Neither one of them is even close to as pretty as you. So she she took that good. And anyway, introducing 22-year veteran FBI agent, Fordham Law degree, <laughs> and now he's writing for all kinds of TV shows, Jim Clemente. Jim, welcome to the show. How you doing? It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me on, Sergeant Bill and Sergeant Michael. Good to see you. Jim, how was that as an introduction, man? Weren't you almost was, getting like excited? Was that almost I, well, like graduating I was like, from the FBI? Uh, <laughs> you're really kind of building me up a little bit too much, I think. Uh, I don't think so. I don't. Think Bobby, so. on the other hand, he's an amazing guy. So, well, we're gonna bring Bobby on right now too. Bobby Chacon, Bobby, welcome to the show. Bobby Chacon, a 27 year veteran, retired FBI agent. He's a scuba diver. He's an underwater forensics. Uh, I had a picture of you from years ago. In your scuba diving outfit, here you are, and right there, he was he was jacked. He was jacked back then. What happened? You stopped lifting weights? A long time ago. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't realize it was that long ago, but you look good. So he's an underwater forensics expert. He teaches the uh, the class to the FBI. He's a professor. He's got a damn law degree from Hofstra University. All you guys, you overachievers. Anyway, let's get to the topic tonight. I think it's it's so fascinating. And uh, Jim, I know that uh, Bobby had said that you were um, like his mentor, pretty much in uh, well, in, in writing. Profile. Yeah. Well, uh, we we have you know we we kind of cross paths uh, at the FBI Academy, and then the New York office, and then I uh, I ended up uh, going to Little Rock doing the Whitewater investigation, and then back to Washington D.C., and then down to Quantico to be in the profiling unit, and but when and then I came out to L.A. when I retired in 2009 and then Bobby was out here and uh, I got to uh, start hanging out with him and working with him in the 
fictional world. So we uh, we keep uh, we keep the Criminal Minds franchise uh, as close to reality as they will allow us uh, on the network. So that that's so exciting because you know even when you watch some of these shows. And I'll just say the one thing that makes me cringe the most is on Law and Order when every time they arrest someone, they read Miranda. I want to just, I want to throw a shoe at my TV screen. I just, it just kills me. What do you think, Bobby? It's just an easy way out for a writer to fill space. That's what it comes down to. It's like so most of these writers, they only know what they've seen on TV before. That's why well, we, yeah. it's oftentimes stuff that you've seen before because the writers don't write from life experience. They're writing from stuff that they've seen before. And Which so, is- you know, when you get in a, a writer's room like we had, you know, and Jim and I, you know, you you know, we're often the only people that didn't graduate with an MFA degree from some liberal arts college. <laughs> and we're dealing with real life, real world life experience, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a, you know, Jim's a little humble. The, the, the main character that started the Criminal Minds franchise, played by Mandy, Mandy Patankin in the beginning, was based on Jim. Um, Jim was down at Behavioral Science Unit. He was recovering from cancer that he contracted at, at Ground Zero during 9-11. And, oh, wow. they, and the producer came by and wanted to talk to a profiler because they had this idea for a show. Jim was happened to be available because he was recovering and he was on light duty. And he and him and Mandy, they, they struck a, a friendship up. And to this day, it lasts. But, you know, Jim later became, uh, you know, an advisor, writer and producer on that show for all of its 15 years. There's a reason it lasted 15 years. It's because it was based in reality. Yeah. Um, the, a lot of these shows we saw Clarice, you know, lasted one season. East New York, that new show lasted one season. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I know, but Bobby, how many times? How many times in the room did we hear from these younger writers? Uh, no, no, that would never happen in the real world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'd be like, well, you know, when you when you, you start telling, about? we're when telling you, you telling them slang. We did that. <laughs> We yeah. did that. Yeah. yeah. So yes. it's been it, it's a it's an uphill battle sometimes. But, you know, but what's great was in Criminal Minds, the showrunner that started the show was Ed Bernero and he was a Chicago cop. So I said to him, look, as long as you, you know, don't hurt us doing our job, I'll help you. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and I did. And he was really, really so uh, welcoming. And, you know, they took care of me and they they listened. They listened and they. You know, I got while I was a profiler. So the first five seasons of Criminal Minds, I was still in the FBI. And while I was a profiler, I got calls from cops in small towns in Tennessee or, you know, middle America. And and they said, look, I saw Criminal Minds last night. Is it true that you guys help like small town cops too? how much do we have to pay you? You know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, no, this is a free service. We're, we're happy to, to help. And so it did help us do our job. And, and think of how many more people know what profiling is now because of that show. I mean, it's now uh, it's it's gone through 16 seasons now because it's had one season of, and Paramount Plus. But for 2021 and 2022, it was the number one streaming show on the planet. So this is two years after it was canceled. It was still the number one show on the planet. So that's why they brought it back. But it, it was a, it was a great experience and, you know, taught me how to be a good writer and taught Bobby how to be a good writer, taught my brother, Tim, how to be a good writer. So wow. we all, we all kind of uh, leapt into it to try to bring some authenticity to, uh, to Hollywood. That's fantastic. And you, know, you guys, things... you guys have a lot of stories. Maybe we'll bring you out too. Well, you know, the thing is people love cop slang. When he yeah. hears something like, yeah, I'm going to give that guy a wood shampoo. They love that shit, you know, or, or handbag. People are like, what does handbag mean? Oh, handbag is what they called an old time cop because they never used to buy new uniforms because they'd get the uniform check around Christmas and they would buy presents for their family. Right. So their uniforms looked like hair was growing at it. They have the term ha- handbag, you know. Mike, you want to lend a few uh, uh, slangs to let's this? See. Um, let's see. Rabbi. You have a rabbi. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I used that term one time. I was in a. Uh, uh, we were doing a uh, uh, working with uh, the city when they were uh, one of the former Black Panthers was suing us for for you know civil rights violations and I was and he had just graduated law school and I was out also and he was a civilian he'd never worked in law enforcement so I was talking to another guy who was a cop and I said yeah yeah I don't got a rabbi and it got the the kid who's he's Jewish and looked at me he goes 
like there's a lot of Jewish like rabbis like on the, on the job. And I'm like, no, there's no rabbis. But if you got one, that makes you special. You got a phone call. That's it. So that's one of my favorites, rabbi. Yeah. So just so people know, it's they we use the same term in the FBI, and it okay. was you know sort of a mentor, somebody who'd yeah. been there a long time. By the time you got in, and was willing to take you under their wing and make sure you didn't step in the wrong place at the wrong time and and really help you you know learn how to do interrogations learn how to do investigations learn how to treat a crime scene things like that and and write the reports that was also a big thing so that's what that's what a rabbi is for in the fbi and i'm and i'm sure it's the same in the nypd well they also the bigger uh thing than a rabbi is a contract and a contract is someone within the job that can do you know, he can make you leap big walls. You know, you can get over anything if you have a contract. Oh, you want to go to joint robbery task force? You need a rabbi and a contract, <laughs> you know? You want to well, go to somehow, JTTF? Yeah, you need both. <laughs> somehow I got there without one. I don't know how, but uh, I got lucky. So it was great. It was a great experience being on the joint bank robbery task force with the NYPD. And uh, I had two detective partners, Joseph Gelfan. He was a... Uh, first grade and and chris montanino was his dad a chief um i elson I gelfand i think that was his dad really it all was coming clear while he was yeah. first grade. <laughs> <laughs> well i i met him yeah there so but they're yeah they were great guys to work with and and i remember our first year on, on the bank robbery squad we had two thousand bank robberies and you know of course at that time there were so many we 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 of course did you know, the, the follow up on every one of them, but we didn't actually put boots on the ground until they had done three, four, five, six jobs. So we only went after crews that kept coming back because there right. were so many. But it was, oh, it was great. ridiculous. Right. Yeah. And how many, you know, it's going to be, it's going to go back to that again because with the way they are pro approaching crime right now, they don't yeah. want to put anyone in jail. They don't lock anyone up. It's not the fault of the shooter, it's the fault of the gun. The gun I, did that. I was, yeah. I was working gangs in, in Brooklyn in, in, nine, in 89, 90, 91. We had 2,000 homicides, over 2,000 homicides, right, in the city of New York. I think we yeah. had 22, 2245 or something. And I was working in 6777. Uh, I had two, two guys, uh, Willie Bishop and, and Bobby Powell uh, from uh, Brooklyn South Homicide, that were constant, uh, you know, a, a lunch with them, dinner with them. And we were working all these homicides, but we, we couldn't even keep up with homicides that year. And, and, and you're right, Bill, I think it could be going back to that. I mean, I never yeah. thought we'd see that again. You know, 2,200 homicides in one year. But now I'm not so sure. Yeah. You know, Bobby and Jim, they have the blueprint to stop it. And yep. that's Comstat. They don't and have that's the will. Yeah, and broken windows, but they threw all of that out because of they, political ideology. They don't and have the will. They they do have. They know exactly what to do. They just don't have the political will to do it. No, they absolutely don't. Donnie Lynn, thank you so much for the ten dollars super sticker and Girl Friday. Thank you for joining the Police Off the Cuff YouTube membership. Very much appreciated. Awesome. I want to get guys. I want to get to Rex Ewerman, and I sure. think Jim, you may even have written this, or or they may have interviewed. This is from the New York Times. And this is, in 2011, what a profiler, and I think you were probably interviewed for this. That was me. Had said, this is about Rex Schumann. In 2011, so again, that's, this is 12 years before he was arrested. He is most likely a white male in his mid-20s to mid-40s. He's married or has a girlfriend. He's well-educated and well-spoken. He's financially secure, has a job, and owns an expensive car or truck. Rex Schumann was 47 at the time. He was and is married. He has an architecture degree and ran a consulting firm that specialized in dealing with New York City's building codes and the officials at the Department of Buildings who approve applications for building owners. Judging from the 2022 interview, he's well-spoken in some ways, even charming. He owned a Chevrolet Avalanche pickup truck. Now, how did you, for our listeners, how did you pick that out? How did you well, know? I'll, I'll go through it. So the white male part is basically all done on numbers that is the most common um when you have white victims there's a there's a strong possibility that the offender is also going to be white um they're also the most uh they're, they're the most prominent race in the area and that therefore that's that's why we said white but male was because this these are clearly sex crimes and 
violent sex crimes. And that leans towards uh, male offenders in most cases. But um, I actually said mid 30s to mid 40s. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, that's exactly the age range where he was offending. Um, in other words, these were sophisticated crimes. Uh, it's not something that we would generally see in a 20 year old. Um, it's something that generally the offender takes quite a bit of time. And, and these are compulsive crimes. In other words, he's fantasizing about these crimes. And so he's thinking about these and planning on and on and on. And as he goes forward with his crimes, he gets more sophisticated. And this guy was able to actually do this repeatedly. At the time, you know, they had found up to 10 or 11 bodies that could be attributed to him. And he used the same general area dumping grounds. So we said he was from the area, that this wasn't just a coincidence that he happened on this area. He knew he could go there. He knew he'd have privacy and he knew that he wouldn't stand out there. So he lived, worked or played there. Um, but uh, we said that because of the bindings, the particular bindings that he used, that he was probably a control freak and that that would come out in his home life and his job. And to find out that he was an architect, which is filled with specificity and and precision, that is exactly the kind of job that I would expect this guy to have. When I said he was married, um, I said that because generally somebody who he he's in his 30s or 40s, a lot of times these offenders will have a family that they either control completely or that they use as, as a front for legitimacy. But the thing that, that really got me here was the fact that he was, his, his crime seemed to have a seasonal nature. And, and what I opined at the time was that he was only offending at times when his wife and kids or his parents were away for the summer. And that's exactly what happened. His wife and kids would go out to Maryland and go out to, um, where was it? Iceland. Mm -hmm. I think she was. Yes, yeah. from. And so, you know, I don't know if it was a, um, a marriage where, um, he, he, you know, sort of got a mail order bride. I'm not sure, but that wouldn't surprise me because I really think his family was a front for him. Uh, if you look at the way he kept his house, how much money he put into his guns, but how little he put into his house, the facade of his house was falling apart. He, his, his wife was using food stamps. I think his family, that's just an indication of how he actually looked at his family, what he actually felt about his family. And so, um, the, the, the marriage and that, and the fact that he only killed when they were on vacation was, was easy to predict from his behavior. Um, I said that he was a sexual sadist. Um, and that came from the fact that he used one of the victim's phones to call that victim's sister and taunt her and tell her what he did. And that is a sadistic act that, that helps him relive that fantasy. In other words, he wants to have as much of a ripple effect from these horrific acts that he committed as he possibly can. He wants to relive them as many times as he can. So I, I said, you will, you will see this come out in his home life and in his crimes and in his work. Um, I, 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 you know, I already said these are, these are like fantasy based crimes. They, they, this kind of offender has started thinking about this probably in late adolescence and just, he would he would do these these basically intro crimes, these precursor crimes like like um, peeping Tom and and maybe exposing himself or breaking into homes and, and, and going into underwear drawers and things like that. Those kinds of crimes. I bet you we're going to find out that this guy has done a, a, a serious amount of them over the time over time. Um, I also said that. The fact that he used burlap to not only wrap the victims, but also bind some of them. This tells me that he has this is a very strange. This is an unusual method of binding. And so I believed that there was at least some connection between him and burlap. I didn't know if he was getting it from, you know, from being, a, you know, a gardener or if he had some other thing at work. It turns out. One thing that they didn't release was that it was camouflage burlap. And of course, that's used by hunters, duck hunters. They make a blind with the camouflage burlap with holes in it so they can stick their guns out and see through it. And that's where he got that. And of course, a number of his rifles were hunting rifles because he was a duck hunter. Um, 
I said he would have a truck or a van to transport his victims. Uh, we thought it would be sort of on the higher end because, uh, you know, he probably when he's in it, he wants to look good. He wants his self-image to, to be good. And he's fairly forensically sophisticated. In other words, he did a fairly good job of of hiding these victims long enough for them to decay completely. And that tells me he's he's got almost complete. Um, uh, I can't. I'm, I, why did I lose the word? Um, uh, concealment. Sorry. He has almost permanent concealment, and it's at least long enough to get rid of much of the evidence. So, because of the way these bodies were found, they don't know the actual cause of death, though they know the manner of death was homicide. So that helped him forensically. So we put his forensic sophistication at pretty high. And and his criminal sophistication is fairly high. I think he's been committing crimes for a very long time, and he knows exactly how to avoid detection. For example, when we found out that after the Chevy av avalanche that he was driving was seen and reported to the cops, he transferred that car down to his brother in South Carolina. He didn't sell it. If he sold it, there would be a transaction record. What he did was he gave it to his brother, bought another one that's a slightly different color so that people, if they saw him with it, they would say, oh, that's not the same color as the guy who saw it. So it must not be the same car. And they moved on. Well, it turns out because of maybe because of some politics and maybe because the head of that department was into some bad things himself at the time. That investigation didn't go anywhere at the time, but you know, Jim, you know, Jim, if I could just interrupt you. Yeah, I'm sorry uh, for keeping up. Professor, no, it's fascinating. Professor Mike Geary calls what you just described consciousness of guilt. There you go. And that or premeditation, if you will. Absolutely. You know, because he's planning every move, but he he's he knows he's guilty and he's doing things to prevent himself from getting caught, i.e., the burner phones. Uh right. but then he did also some stupid things too. For a smart guy. And, well, what uh, he didn't realize is that having the burner phone in the same vehicle with him as his real phone, just because he's using the burner phone doesn't mean that we can't track it down. Now, that's a lot of data to pull off a bunch of towers in such a metropolitan area. But obviously, that's one of the big things that was done. His phone was traveling and hitting the same towers as this burner phone was. And the burner phones that were used to call these girls we're hitting at his home, at his office, and at this in the area of the dump site. So it, it he wasn't as criminally sophisticated as he thought he was. Vet girl, thank you for the 1999 super sticker. And would he be one of the first to evolve with technology, internet, cell apps? Please and thank you. We got to answer that. <laughs> well, uh, I'm afraid he's not the first. No, uh, we've had plenty of serial killers who who take advantage of whatever technology there is. And, you know, fortunately, a lot of times it's also their their downfall. It's also how we catch them. Um, but we have had Bobby, you could talk about some of the you know, things that we have done in in surveillance and, you know, with silverfish, I think, in the back in the back back in the i don't know 90s right we were using Wait, these... are, you are you talking about trigger fish trigger fish sorry did i say oh, silver yeah you yeah. said silver fish i was like what that's <laughs> you mean See, i know something that the fbi does you know, the fbi the fbi just has a different nickname for it yeah. oh okay. <laughs> yeah good 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 out you know bobby i wanted to ask you something also it was fascinating to me now i've been out the, off the job for 12 years so technology is has kept growing and i i haven't you know, at least knowing what they're doing. I found it fascinating that they were able to search his computer remotely. That That's yeah, amazing to yeah. me. I mean, look, that's where the world is moving, right? We're all cloud-based now. Everything is cloud-based, right? And we don't have, I mean, you hardly have hard drives anymore and stuff. And so, like, that's that's one of the things Jim's talking about. Like, the advancement in technology does help the bad guys, but also helps us too. If we can leverage that, if we can keep, you know, bringing in hackers on the good guy side, and, and, and keep, you know, keep, uh, you know, at least pace with technology. That's one of those things. And like, I mean, we still have them. I, I still have a little hard drive right here, but I think eventually there, even there are going to be a thing of the past. Everything is going to be cloud-based. I don't know what, what percentage is now, but certainly a lot more is cloud-based now than it was say 10 years ago. Um, and so, 
you know, the fact that they can remotely search his hard drive is a function of that. Everything now being cloud-based, they go up, you know, obviously they go up in the cloud, they go over and they come down into his computer or they're searching his cloud-based stuff. Um, it's really going to be, you're not even going to be able to probably buy hard drives in a couple of years. Right. Um, you know, and so, so you're right. That's, and I think that's what Jim's alluding to is that you, you know, it does help them, but it also helps us. You know, my kids and my wife, break my chops about my lack of computer skills now. I can imagine if this goes further, they're going to stay off the computer. <laughs> I, my so, Instagram post, I go, do you know what you put on Instagram? I go, no, what happened? <laughs> just tell them that you're waiting for AI. That's all. Yeah, well, that, I have a few stories about that. That's funny. Some attorney sent me a letter saying they were suing me for using this photo on my show. I was like, what are you kidding? It was like a headshot of somebody, right? So I wrote a letter addressing each of their points. And then I was like, that's not that good. I gave it to AI. I go, spruce this up and address. AI wrote the most unbelievable letter. And I, I showed it to Mike and I showed it to another attorney. And they go, that's pretty damn good. I didn't tell them that. I didn't write it. So I said it. I haven't heard from them since. <laughs> yeah, good. You're going to have AI lawyers pretty soon. Like yeah, that. exactly. Well, there's one guy who actually got, I think he got disbarred or at least was held in contempt because he answered a motion all through AI and he didn't actually check it. Sometimes <laughs> AI can be a little bit loose, fast yeah. and loose with some of the things they put in there. But, yeah. but anyway, so the last thing I'll say is that, you know, this guy's crimes were very well planned, right? I mean, he timed them for a reason. And that was because he had the more, more freedom when his wife and kids were away. But, there were a couple of crimes that I think that were unplanned um, there. We, they haven't yet tied him to all the murders there, all the, the bodies that they, that they found there. But it's it's probably, you know, a, a fair, a fairly good possibility that they are tied to him. But there is one toddler there um, that, as a victim. And I think most likely one of the women showed up with her kid and he didn't expect that, but it wasn't going to stop him. So he went ahead and, and killed the kid as well. Um, I know that I saw reported somewhere that that uh, that the kid was wrapped in a blanket, the body. And uh, somebody reported that 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 means that it was probably a woman who committed that offense. Well, actually, no, that's something we call undoing. And it would be um, expected if this offender did not expect to kill a child, did not want to or plan to kill a child, but then found himself in a position where he did feel he needed to. That is why we he might try to undo it by covering up that victim more than he did the other victims. So that's that's what I would expect. There's also, I believe, an Asian male who was yes. found in that area. And I don't know. And I'm I'm not casting any kind of dispersions i don't i'm not making any kind of judgment on this but it may very well be that this person may have been pretending to be a female and that may be why he ended up in that same position i don't know it could have been a totally unrelated crime but for me that is a possibility that that that's what happened and that's why well jim some now. of his searches on his computer he did search asian twink or something like okay, that. okay well then then and that might be it I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And so let me play a little bit of Rex Hume and we'll get a little bit of a look at him here. Yeah. In the case of the mom from New Jersey who was murdered in Las Vegas. The fact that they've asked for a comparison means that there may be something to compare for him or there may be a reason to eliminate him. Thanks for joining us here on Law and Crime. I'm Anjanette Levy. Rex Hureman currently faces murder charges in the deaths of three women found on Gilgo Beach. He's pleaded not guilty to the murders of Amber Costello, Melissa Bartholomew, and Megan Waterman. While Hureman lived on Long Island for decades, he also had timeshares in Las Vegas. Police searched that property after Hureman's arrest last month. News 12 on Long Island is reporting that Hureman's DNA will be examined in the murder of Victoria Camera. 20 years ago, a gravel truck driver found Camera's body in the desert in Boulder City about 30 mm -hmm. minutes outside of Las Vegas. Camera was originally from New Jersey. Relatives said she turned to prostitution to make a living after having a child at age 17. Mm. Camera was strangled, 
and so were the Gilgo Four. Retired Las Vegas Metro police cold case detective Phil Ramos was looking at similarities between Gilgo Beach and Vegas cases before he recently retired. I wasn't surprised about the arrest in the case, um, but I was surprised that there was a Vegas connection. That's clear across the country, and, and we don't often have similarities um, with that kind of distance. Um, you know, there, there, there are a number of active serial killers working right now as we speak, um, and they could, they could be working any series of states, cities, counties, jurisdictions, um, but to have one that far away in New York, that did surprise me, yeah. Ramos didn't work Victoria Camera's case, but he did work the cases of three other sex workers that were similar to the Gilgo Beach murders. Three that I worked are of particular interest that may have some similarities to Gilgo. Um, and that's not to say that it's the same suspect or anything like that. They just have some general similar characteristics in that um, they were, you know, the victimology profiles the same. They were young sex workers they were uh, murdered and they were left on the side of a road, which is kind of generic similarities because that's 90% of our sex workers that get killed end up on the side of the road out here. It's just out here in Vegas, we have thousands of square miles of desert and um, sometimes it takes a long time to find their bodies. So this is scary. So here you have Las Vegas. I think they mentioned South Carolina. There's a body that he's, uh, uh, for some reason, Atlantic City, they had four, but they're saying he's already cleared from those. I don't know how they cleared it that quickly. But as you said, Jim, it's scary. Potentially, he was 59 years old. How many bodies this good guy could have on him? And right. it's going to take unbelievable police work and investigative skills and science, of course, because we've seen what they can do with investigative genetic genealogy. Uh, so they, when he was arrested, you know, people, oh, it's all, no, it's the investigation really has just begun. Right. You no, know? right. It really yeah. has. Mike, yeah. I want to give you something to say think, because you haven't had anything And I think to what say. people have to understand is like, you know, once he, gave, once he came on their radar, like last year, right? Once they kind of knew this is probably our guy, they looked at the cases they had and which ones they had the best evidence to move forward with. And they said, okay, you know, out of the 10 or 11, these are the three we can really hone in on. And when the prosecutors were comfortable enough to go to the charging phase, because with double jeopardy, you got to be careful when you go to, you got to be ready to move the day you charge somebody. You have to theoretically say the next day we got to go to trial because that's the mindset you got to be in because there's no delay. Speedy trial means you got to keep going. So, and there's going to be motions and there's going to be hearings. And so I think they honed in on the three that they could use to get this guy off the street get him convicted, and then at least you can take a breath and you can investigate all these other things. You don't want to leave him out on the street to possibly murder again, right? I mean, that may have been what happened back in 2011. And, and so they thought, okay, we can get him on these three. So people should understand that they charged him with the three that they probably had the best evidence to go and get a conviction right now. And then take a breath and have more people and take your time in investigating his involvement in many of these others. I'm with Jim. I think that probably I, I would be so shocked if those other bodies in Gilgo Beach aren't attributable to him. I agree. Mike? Oh, I'm just fascinated by Jim, what you're talking about with all the, the criminology for and predictions you had for Sherman. I just had one question because this is fascinating. Do you think that early on, maybe in his early 20s, he was visiting prostitutes and hiring them, but he didn't kill them. But at some point he devolved into uh, violence against them. Or do you think he was the kind of person who would stalk them, hire them with the thought of that he's going to kill them right off the bat? Yeah, I think, well, what we found when we, you know, in the behavioral analysis unit, we had we had done um i think by the time i left i think 1500 interviews of convicted sex i mean serial offenders uh that's rapists and and murderers and um you know what we found in general is that in their 20s i mean typically they 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 realize that they want to do these bad things in in late adolescence and it takes them a little time to build up to it. And that's why we see many of the pre precursor crimes. And, and these crimes are crimes that, you know, help them build that fantasy. And they're, they're working their way up to a point where they have, you know, sort of 
their you know feet firmly planted. They've had the fantasy for many years. They've they've masturbated to reinforce that arousal pattern. They ha they have a very tight connection between violence and sex, and it would leak out in his sexual behavior with prostitutes or with girlfriends at that time. But I think it he he probably didn't start killing till he was in his 30s. And that that's the general pattern. Of course, there's some people that that break that pattern, but that's right. what we predicted. And apparently, at least with the bodies that were on Gilgo Beach, um, they would have been there for, for, I guess, over a 10 year period, which right. um, which was between 35 and 45 in, of his age. Right. Thank you. You know, Jim, what's what's to me is fascinating is the concept of organized and disorganized offenders. Because mm -hmm. no doubt Rex Ewerman is an organized offender, but he has some disorganized traits also. Look at his well, goddamn house. <laughs> if that's not a disorganized house, I don't know what is, you know? Right. But so that's why, you know, th that those terms were were very, you know, pigeonholed in the past. And and we we would talk about things like, you know, high risk and low risk and organized and disorganized. But what Ken Lanning did, who was my mentor in the behavioral analysis unit. He put everything on a continuum. Everything is a spectrum. In other words, it's not just organized and disorganized. It's a whole continuum in between. There's a lot of gray area. And so what you'll find is that from person to person, they can move along that line over time. You know, they could be pushing from disorganized to organized or organized to disorganized or based on the stress level at the time whether they're using alcohol or drugs at the time. You know, it's it's about these these crimes are fantasy based. These kinds of sex crimes, they're fantasy based. They're not just impulsive. The people who do impulsive crimes, for example, you know, you might see, you know, that's like the stranger danger kind of guy. The guy who's lurking behind the tree and, and grabs a kid who's walking home from school has no plan, has no, you know, has not fantasized about it, but seizes this opportunity because you know, either they're 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 on drugs or, or alcohol or their stress level is so high that they're just acting much more impulsively. So in this case, it, you know, especially the repetition and the using the same, you know, the burlap and the, that seems like a ritual type behavior and tying them in a particular way. All that stuff sounds like ritualistic behavior. Now, that's not M.O., but. With the MO, if you have MO aspects, modus operandi, method of operation, things that are necessary to commit the crime and to get away with it, plus these ritual behaviors, these things that aren't necessary but satisfy an inner need of the offender, that's a signature. And that's how we would link crimes over a geographic distance or a length of time. And in this case, I don't know, you know, because I don't have the case files on all these 11 victims, but... Um, but certain aspects of it do seem to, you know, to be of a signature. But there's a lot of question marks. I don't have all the answers on that. People often get ritual and MO kind of mixed up or crossed a little bit. But they're actually two separate and distinct criteria or, or behavior patterns and stuff. I had a question, Jim, and I don't know the answer to this. And it really it, it evolved for me the other night when I watched a special on Joel Rifkin um, and one of I think one of his actually college classmates was on the job NYPD mm. and he went up to Rifkin and after he retired and, and that's, that's right that's right did you see that a series recorded no, I, I know that I know the guy who went to high school yeah, with him. yeah. it's called Rifkin wow. on Rifkin my question yeah. is does because I think Rifkin was actually visiting a lot of prostitutes and stuff like that but he wasn't killing every single one in fact right. he had a couple that he was like regulars with if he saw them he would go out with them and have sex with them and then not kill them Right. Do you think like a guy like human is he is he having a an active life like that with prostitutes that he doesn't kill or every time he sees a prostitute is he killing them? No, I think I think he's most likely been engaged with prostitutes over a long period of time and I don't think he kills every one of them, but I think he he sets his he sets his targets on particular types. For example, these 3 women are very petite. We know that he was collecting child pornography. Um, we know that he was most likely in his brain trying to 
fit these girls, these young ladies into the pattern of of his, you know, affection. He he wanted to have sex with girls, with underage girls, but obviously they weren't as available to him. And he's smart enough to know that if you abduct a girl, even if you're really criminally sophisticated and you can abduct a girl, you the heat goes up tremendously immediately. I mean, everybody is called out. But unfortunately, when somebody is a sex worker, when somebody puts themselves in that position, not whether they voluntarily did it or they were forced into it, either way, they become a very high risk victim. And it's very difficult when you're engaging in high risk behavior. It's very difficult to actually track that back to the kind of person who who actually committed those crimes. So the people, the offenders, the serial offenders who are who are not as sophisticated, not as experienced, will go after the easy pickings, the high risk victims. And that's what Huerman did. And that tells me he he either knew that he wasn't sophisticated enough or smart enough to pull it off or he was afraid of the consequences if he tried to, for example, tried to abduct a soccer mom or a child that would have raised so many more alarm bells and he certainly wouldn't have been able to operate in in the dark for you know over a decade you know jim in early in july he was in some park in massapequa which was his hometown and he popped out of like the woods to this girl that was riding a bike and she was like immediately terrified of him and he was like oh how are you you know i'm rex shurman whatever he said to her Right. But she was terrified enough that he disappeared back into the woods. She called the police. And when he was arrested, she was, that's the guy who popped out of the woods on me. Right. So there's a little bit of him acting out a behavior that maybe he couldn't control. Or Yes, or um, he had no intention of actually abducting and killing her, but he wanted to scare the shit out of her. Can I say shit on this? I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. I can't. Sorry. But he wanted to scare her because, remember, he's a sadistic guy. All right. He gets off. He he's sexually aroused by that. He can relive that in his mind and he can, you know, the more women he can scare, the more he can fantasize about it. And, you know, maybe I don't know what time of year that was, but maybe it was his off season when his wife and kids were around and he couldn't take no, anybody. No, it, home. it was a, it was like a week or two before he got arrested. Right. OK. It was in July. Well, and that. All right. Well, that may very well have been why they decided to arrest him and and uh, take him out when he was in Manhattan away from his guns because they were afraid that he was getting antsy and he was going to grab somebody off the street. So, yeah, well, Jim, there was two reasons they said they pulled the trigger on the arrest. One was they were worried about the integrity of the investigation. You know, you write 300 subpoenas. One of the people you're writing the subpoena to could tell the person who's the subject, hey, the FBI or the police are looking into you, and that could blow it. The other one was his behavior. He was still using burner phones. He was still meeting with prostitutes. They were afraid that he was going to kill again. So that was why they pulled the trigger maybe earlier than they wanted to. Right. Well, um, and, you know, if it was just a couple of weeks before, if that happened to that woman just a couple of weeks before he was arrested, I have to believe that he was under surveillance at the time, you know. Was this so, a young girl on the bike? With like, was she? Yeah, so she, she was like in her early twenties, I think. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, so I, I just, I, I have to believe that that he was under under surveillance at the time, and and that probably all got, you know, it locked ratcheted in. everything up. Yeah, it ratcheted yeah. everything up. Yeah. But you know, let me tell you, I mean, this guy, you know, he's a he's a he's a big guy, you know, and he's extremely sadistic so i'm certain that these women all these victims had a horrific time with this guy i mean just a horrific time and it just i feel you know i feel so bad for them and for their families for what they went through and you know i just hope that that this case is strong enough i mean it appears to be extremely strong and i just hope that he's away forever and he will never ever hurt anybody again Absolutely. You know, I wanted to mention something also, and, and since you guys are both experts, what type of trophies do you think he took 
from these victims. Okay, so first of all, I want to distinguish between souvenirs and trophies, okay? Trophies are things like jewelry that he would take from a victim and give to his wife or his girlfriend or his kids. Um, things that trophies, just like a regular trophy, is something that you would show off. You may not tell anybody the genesis of it, but you'd want to have it in a place where you're showing it off. It's displaying. Whereas, you're displaying yeah, a trophy. You're displaying, right. Whereas a souvenir is something that you keep to yourself and it reminds you of the incident. So he could take locks of hair. He could take jewelry. He could take, um, you know, anything that was the victim's. It could be a piece of clothing, um, underwear, whatever. And generally, those are the kinds of things that I would expect. I don't know because of the condition of the bodies, whether he took any body parts as souvenirs. Um, but. Uh, he may very well have taken something as a souvenir or as a trophy. He may have some, given something to his wife or to his daughter, you know, and and every time he looked at that, he could go through that fantasy of what he did to that poor woman who, who he victimized. Would that be like a sexual type of experience? 100 percent. that? 100 yeah. percent. Absolutely. Um, and that whole point of him going through these fantasies, these are sexual fantasies for him. But don't get me wrong. They're not typical sex sexual fantasies. They are violent sexual fantasies. This is what turns him on. He's a sexual sadist, which means he is aroused by causing and witnessing the suffering of others. And that can be directly right in front of him with his victim or indirectly when he calls the victim's sister and taunts her and tells her what he did to her sister. Because he knows that that ripple effect that's going to, you know, by, by talking to the family like that, family members who love this victim, um, he's actually victimizing them, re-victimizing re them. So the cell phones that he took, one was of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, the other one was of Melissa Bartolome. Souvenir or trophy? Well, uh, it... It may be, um, a, it, it could be a. This is called the FBI tap dance. No, it, what it is, <laughs> is actually kidding. doing, doing what we do. I mean, this is how we work. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have five months to prepare a profile. <laughs> we literally right. did it live. You know, the cops came in and we, they presented the cases and we gave them what we knew at that moment. And, you know, for me, you know, there's certain trophy aspects because he called the phones he called them on the phone so they were aware that he had that um you know whether he took anybody else's phones i don't know but i i don't think that he was um displaying them to anybody um and i think he probably used them for a practical purpose to expand the ripple effect of the torture that he inflicted upon the victims so they may have been utilitarian, uh, but, you know, there certainly is a trophy aspect because he did use at least one of the phones and called one of the girls. I don't know if he called both of them. Do you? I think, yeah, I think he used each one of those girls' phones to call a family member. Okay. Uh, and I, Dr. Joni Johnson was on the show and she said the same thing. That's a sexually sadistic thing to do and he really gets off on that type of thing absolutely there's no question i mean you know we had to sit there and we had about an 841 question questionnaire uh that we would go through with these offenders and you know these repeat offenders it could take us sometimes two weeks of interviewing them every day for as long as they would stay in that room and we would have them go through every crime and for a lot of them we knew that they're sitting there you know, getting aroused, thinking about it, going through this. They, they were happy to talk to us about it because it gave them an opportunity to relive those fantasies. And it's disgusting, but it's something that we had to sit through in order to get this data so that we could help reverse engineer the crimes in the future and hopefully prevent more victims from being killed. The serial killer well, I worked first before I retired, uh, well, a couple of years before I retired, these were keys, um, when, when we finally caught him, um, he had, he had uh, raped and killed and dismembered a 19 year old girl. That was his last victim. I recovered her. Um, he insisted on being interrogated or interviewed by a female detective and female agent. Uh, and because we only had a certain, we only had that first victim and we knew he, he had more, they had to play this cat and mouse game with him 
So he was up in Anchorage. So an Anchorage PD uh, female detective and a female FBI agent went in and had to listen to him describe the th hor horrific things that he did to her, to his last victim. Um, but it was one of those things where we had to play his game for a certain period of time in those interviews so that we could get some some information back out, out of him. And and I think he was doing exactly what Jim said. I think he was getting off looking into a, a female face and telling her these things. You know, Bobby, that's like when you first come on the job, first in law enforcement, and you're sitting in on the interviews with the detectives because when you were a cop, you just got to sit in, you're going to get, and you'd be like, you'd want to go across the table and strangle the guy but you realize that you you know you had to keep your cool and this is part of law enforcement this is how building the, our best revenge is putting him in jail or putting him in prison that's our best well revenge. i i had that exact conversation with my wife because um keys eventually killed himself in jail he hung himself um and so we released all his interrogation tapes they're on youtube you can go, go see and he's talking in detail about killing people and and all the horrific things he did and then at, at parts you see you see one of the agents or detectives come in and give him a soda and a snickers bar and they go did snickers right or was it milky way what did you want you know like and my wife is hearing me, I'm reviewing some of these tapes for an appearance I was doing. And she's like, how could you do that? How could you like buy him a Coke? How could you ask what his favorite candy bar was? I'm like, you have, you have to treat him. You have to, It's a cat and mouse. You have to treat him the way he wants to be treated for a certain period of time. Look, he's he's here. He's in cuffs. He ain't going there. He's going to be probably the rest of his life, you know, whether that's a month or, you know, a decade, he's not ever going to be out and hurting people again, but we have a job to do. We have to get this information out of him. And at least at that point, we had to play that game. We had to give him a cigar. If he wanted a cigar, we had to give him a, a Snickers. And if he wanted a Milky Way, we had to go out and exchange the, the Snickers for a Milky Way, uh, you know, and, and that was just, and she was just abhorred by that. She just could not, she said, I could never do that. I'm like, well, not many people can. That's, that's, right. a, that's, a, that's pretty. I, I remember Bobby, when they taught us that in the Academy, like if you're a perp, Wants a soda, buy him a soda. Like, I ain't buying him shit, you know. <laughs> yeah, you learned, you learned as you went yeah, along. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's amazing. It, you know, it's all about building rapport, and you know, it's something that uh, you know it just proves. I mean, you're dealing as bad as these people are, and and we have dealt with some really bad people, all of us, I'm sure, but they're still human beings. And if you can build a human bridge of rapport with them, uh, they, 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 you can build debt of gratitude and, and they will they will come forward and say things that they wouldn't say if you were just being, you know, an asshole to them. Right. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. The art of interview and interrogation is there's a Yiddish word we use. It's called schmooze. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to schmooze the perp. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Hey, Bill, may I jump in for a second? And yeah, absolutely. Go okay. ahead. Yeah. Uh, this is I mean, really fascinating. And and I just had uh, one quick question uh, regarding his firearms. I'm not a firearm guy. I only have one. And I know Sherman, when they searched his house, they said there was at least like 200 firearms. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't appear that he used firearms to kill anyone. Mm -hmm. What do, was this, was it uh, was the, the, the number of firearms? Do you think in some way ties into his personality or do you think it was a hobby or was it significant or insignificant at all? The fact that he had like probably more firearms than, you know, than probably ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the people in America like that. Yeah, number. Sure. Yeah, I, I you know, and that was one of the aspects of of his personality that I did not expect or predict. Right. Um, however, I do believe, and I think that's one of the reasons why NYPD, why why they they had him taken down in Manhattan as opposed to, you know, out in Long Island where he'd have access to it. I mean, he had, basically had a bunker there. Yeah. Um, I I believe he he intended to go out with a bang. Um, really? If Good. yeah, if it was just a hobby, uh, then uh, he had ninety one or ninety two registered guns. Right. But the others were unregistered. Why? Why is that? Um, he was a duck hunter. I don't, I don't think you need 200 guns to hunt ducks. <laughs> that's a lot um, of ducks. <laughs> that's a lot of ducks. That's a whole lot of money. I mean, think of it, how much, you know, guns are thousands of dollars, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not cheap when his house is falling apart, you know, let's just say, you know, uh, you know, the, the guns are, you know, are, let's say they were 
five hundred dollars each. That's right. still a hundred thousand right. dollars. Right. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's a lot of money when you know your wife is out using food stamps to get the kids food. So, you know, I think this was something that was really important to him. It probably had uh, had something to do with his ego and how he supported his ego and how he thought, you know, if if they ever come after me, I don't know when he amassed all these illegal ones, but you know, maybe it was in the 12 years between the discoveries of the bodies and the arrest. Maybe during that whole time, he was amassing more and more because he said, I'm never going to let him take me alive. Um, because you know, he wanted to be a big tough guy. Remember in that there's an interview that, that, or yeah, some kind of ad or interview that he did where he was talking to somebody about, yeah, and I have this hammer for negotiations, you know. Yes, I remember that. That was it. creepy. That was very it creepy. Was creepy. And, you know, especially when you think that, you know, he could very well have used that very hammer. He could have been, that's what we would call leakage. He could have been leaking out information about what he did to the victims in the middle of that, you know, innocent. See, most guys innocent. without a law degree call that a Freudian slip. Okay. All right. Well, I hear you. Uh, we call it leakage, and and it it basically shows what's really going on in his mind. And every now and then, you know, you'll see that. And I, like I said, I think he would have been very controlling in his family. And when people ask me, you know, am I shocked that the wife says she didn't know anything about it? Uh, I said, no, I'm not shocked at all. You know, it's very very rare when we see husband and wife teams. Uh, J C Dugard, I think, was one in which there was a husband and wife team. Elizabeth um, but, Smart. Excuse, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Smart. Smart. Yeah. yeah, but that was more, it, it no, literally no. was more like a, a uh, you know, like a cult kind of thing going yeah, on yeah. there. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, uh, the fact that he, um, he had all of these guns and, and the wife, you know, didn't know anything about it. I just think what, what a great turn or twist of events that her hairs ended up helping to identify him, you know, okay. her hairs on the victim. And is that because he took his wife's belt or his wife's clothing and used that during the crime? Is that why her hairs were, were on the victim's bodies? I don't know. Um, but, you know, secondary and tertiary transfer happens all the time. And it's very, very difficult to, to get rid of all of that on you. So I'm glad that, that she was able to help bring him down in, in a certain sense. But I don't know. I don't know at all what their relationship was like. But I would imagine that he must have been coercively controlling her. I understand that he, she was not allowed to go in the basement where he had that, um, that you know, basically gun locker or bunker. Right. Um, and I, that doesn't surprise me because in a number of these cases, um, you know, like BTK and so forth, the offenders have control over their family and they they exert that control and they're able to keep certain areas of the house or certain things in the house private. You know, Jim, I wanted to ask also, you know, they immediately cleared the wife of any involvement in this. But my feelings are that she must have been abused like you can't imagine. And, and I mean, if not physically abused, absolutely psychologically abused. Yeah. Because this guy, as, you know, Rex, uh, Rex, I'm saying I'm using his first name, Rodney Harrison said, the Suffolk County Police Commissioner, he said, Rex Schumann is a monster. And I, he is. He is a monster. So yeah. do monsters treat their family nice? You know what I mean? Well, well um, like I said, I think, the condition of the home and the fact that she's using food stamps while he's amassing a collection worth, you know, a hundred thousand dollars plus of guns is an indicator of how he treated them. I do believe he treated them badly. Um, there are times in which they sort of try to bifurcate their life and, you know, have this sort of showcase family and, so that they can have legitimacy and, and have an excuse to be in a place where kids are because they have kids or, to be in a place in a neighborhood where, you know, where families are uh, because they have families. In other words, he could do his initial surveillance to try to to identify targets 
you know, with his family with him and just driving down a street. I mean, and that could be enough. And maybe he was with his family in that park. I don't know when uh, when he jumped out at that girl. I don't know. But maybe he goes to that park and sees her with his family and then goes back on his own to try to do something to approach her. Um, but, you know, this guy, he was he was smart. Like, you know, he's an architect. Right. I mean, they are so precise and detail is so important to an architect. And and he apparently was very much that way. He wasn't a sloppy architect, um, although he kind of carried himself in a little bit of a sloppy way. Right. And he certainly his home looked very sloppy. So that control that he exerted over his his work and over his victims was the most important thing to him. You know, he didn't like in the neighborhood, you know, everybody said that he was like a weirdo. And, you know, like the neighbor said that he would, you know, he's so tall, he would stand up and look over the fence at his next door neighbor who was sun sunbathing. And, you know, his her husband had to come over and, you know, sort of get loud with him and tell him stop that shit because he was creeping her out. And apparently some parents had said they didn't let their kids trick or treat to that yeah. house because. Oh, really? Was, yeah. Yeah. I, stay, was, stay away from 1313 Mockingbird Lane. You know? <laughs> There's a story with a guy, a kid that grew up in that neighborhood, and him and his dad used to refer to Huberman as, you know, the crazy serial killer guy. And they were doing it just in jest. And then years later, like when he was arrested, the guy was interviewed and he said, my dad called me. They said, hey, did you hear about the serial killer guy? And and he said, no. He goes, what? He goes, he's actually a serial killer. Like for years, they jokingly referred to him because he's the neighborhood weirdo as like a, you know, the serial killer guy that lives in the, in the sloppy house. And they actually literally jokingly referred to him as that. And then it turned out he actually was that. That's crazy. And, you know, I, you kind of brought it up a little bit earlier, um, Bill, but um, you know, I do believe there's a strong possibility that, you know, this property that he bought down in, was it North or South Carolina? I can't remember. Um, next to his brother, across the street from his brother, it's just vacant lots, you right. know. Um, you know, certainly that's a place where uh, you know there's a strong possibility that he could have used that as a as a dumping ground after his Gilgo Beach uh, location was corrupted. You know, was found by law enforcement. Um, I'm I'm pretty certain that he was smart enough not to go back to the same area. But if you go back to cases like the Green River Killer. Um, you know, that guy continued to dump in that area and he continued to hit the same victims, which, you know, they were, you know, prostitutes who who were very high living a very high risk um, existence. Unfortunately, you know, there were lots and lots of them. And this area that he was dumping his victims in was, uh, you know, very secluded and, and very large. And he was able to go back and dump these victims over and over and over again. Fortunately, I mean, when we did the profile in that case, I remember I, we said, look, this is somebody you already talked to, but it, you're, you, like everybody else, thinks you're looking for a monster. Using that label makes us look right past the guy who's sort of like low-key, smiling right, in your face. Right. And yeah. that's why I hate the terms, the, the, the monikers that we give, you know, these serial killers, you know, monster predators, that may be what they're doing, but that's not what they look like, you know, and that's one of the things we tried to do on Criminal Minds. We had we cast regular people in the roles of serial killers because, in fact, I played one once. Um, <laughs> oh, you uh, look like one. No, just I kidding. know, but I do look like <laughs> one, but, you know, I crossed over. So but anyway, the fact is that, you know, when you're when you're looking for a monster, you don't see the guys right in front of you and they play off of that. They know that. And so even though his actions were monstrous, he is a regular guy. He's just a man. And we have to be aware of that when we're thinking about these kinds of offenders. And so we really strive, Bobby and I, you know, when we, when we wrote for criminal minds and for the spinoffs, we, we really tried to push them in that direction to make sure that we're actually educating people while we're entertaining them. That was yeah. our goal. I mean, you're entertaining me. I think, I think this is fascinating. There's a lot. You don't even like to use the word predator for that reason. I mean, there hasn't been one serial killer arrested that had big fangs and dripping blood from his face. <laughs> These are all like Jim says, like Israel Keys was a carpenter. He, his 
live-in girlfriend was a nurse anesthetist. She made good money, worked in a hospital and operating room every day. She slept with, she had a nervous breakdown when she realized she was sleeping with a serial killer. Um, but, but oftentimes, even the people closest to them don't see it. Um, they see their regular life. Like Jim said, it was a, they build this, they spend their life building a facade. Um, and even the people closer to them, I mean, I feel bad for the, the children. Jim and I have talked about the children of serial kills often change their names and have to move away. It really ruins their life. Right, Jim? The, the people yeah. in Southern California, that guy, yeah. the, the, the son and daughter, their lives were ruined. They literally had to reinvent themselves in their early thirties, move away, change, get their names legally changed. Um, because who wants to be, that person who wants to be the, the the son or daughter of a serial killer. Right. Well, here's a good question. Genetic or are you <laughs> raised to be a serial killer? It's uh environment bi or biopsychosocial. Oh, right? someone said so, nature or nurture. <laughs> right. But they always leave out psychology. So it's biopsychosocial. It's a if it's a perfect storm, I say genetics loads the gun, personality and psychology aim it. And experiences pull the trigger but the way you participate in that you have a potentiality with your genetics that doesn't force you to do it but with the millions of little private decisions that you make in the privacy of your own brain you either go towards the light or towards the darkness when you realize what you're doing even as a small child you realize what you're doing is wrong, but you like it. You know, you keep making those decisions. Eventually the snowball effect takes over and you're just rolling down that hill. But the way we actually participate, you know, we help in the formation of our personalities and yeah, we're given a certain, you know, we have some people have psychological issues and disorders and problems and so forth. But again, these are not, these are not solid, you know, at birth. These are things that you help develop over time. And the circumstances you go through are filtered through your personality, right? So if you help form that personality, you also help form how it affects you. And once you decide this is something you want to do and you start thinking about it all the time and you develop these sexual fantasies that are so entrenched in violence and, and hurting women and, and hurting other people, those kinds of things that you reinforce over and over and over again through masturbation over years, you know, you start getting bored with that. And you is that want to actually gun, act on it. I'm sorry. Is that, the, is that the aiming of the gun right there? Yeah, sure. Well, the aiming of the gun is the personality, right? Is the, okay. is, you know, the personality sort of, you know, is your, your participation with the personality. So yes, that can aim the gun that can give you the target. And then, you know, you have to be basically in the right circumstances. If you're in jail, it's probably not going to be a lot of, you know, rape of women and children, you know. Um, but if you're on a desert island somewhere, you know, probably not going to be there. But if you're in a circumstance and you have the intellect to get a job that gives you access to kids or gets get, or you have a situation where you can make money, have a life, have this facade of respectability and just call out and bring in these victims to your, you know, area of control, then that those those experiences are the ones that are pulling the trigger, giving you the opportunity to kill them. There's a professor well, we always, that says, who is it, Professor Young? Is it Professor Young, Jim? The the, the serial killer gene he says it genetically that uh, they can it's Jim Fallon. Yeah. So no Fallon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he he. Um, well, it's a psychopath gene anyway, oh, and he, gene. he found out that he, he had it. Uh, you know, in other words, he was studying uh, psychopathy and a gene that he believes actually determines that, you know, you have the potentiality to be a psychopath. Well, there are CEO psychopaths. A, a number of our presidents have been CEO there was psychopaths. chiefs on the NYPD psychopaths. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, because do you know why? Because maybe you and I wouldn't do it. You became sergeants, right? And, you know, I was a supervisor, but I would never want to work up my way up to the, the, the upper echelons of, of command. Because one, you're not doing the job anymore. And two, you're stepping all over other people. The people that don't give a damn about that, they're the ones that can rise meteorically, <laughs> you know, because they literally don't care. In the FBI, you have to move every 18 months to move up these steps. Well, that means your family is being bounced all over the country. 
Your right. kids are being ripped out of school. Your wife may not be able to do a job or she loses all her friends all the time. You don't give a flying anything about that because all you care about is your career because you're a CEO psychopath. So psychopathy, <laughs> and just so your listeners know, there's a PCLR, Psychopathy Checklist Revised by Dr. Robert Hare, and there's 20 points on it. And when you score somebody against that and it's 20 things and you either get a zero if they don't have it at all, a one if they have it a little bit and two if you have a lot. And if you score more than 30 on that, you're a psychopath. And and what we found, what Jim Fallon, who's a professor at uh, University of California at Irvine, when he was studying psychopathy, he he decided to use his whole family as a control group. So he he got, you know, got the genes of all his family and, you know, put them in as a control group and then he went through and started comparing them to all these psychopaths and then he found out that one of his family members was a psychopath he told his mother and she said you better watch out you know because your great aunt is lizzie borden (laughs) and he's like what and then he flipped over that data and it turns out he was the one that was a psychopath in his family now that doesn't mean you're going to kill people though again the formation of your personality and you you actually making choices in the privacy of your brain to go towards the dark side versus the light side, that is what makes somebody a killer or not. And so many people become who are psychopathic. In other words, they don't have human empathy. They literally have no capacity or they're probably on a sliding scale, but they have very little or no capacity to actually care about another human being. They see other people successfully have relationships and they want that. They want to look that way so they can mimic it. But they're not actually feeling those feelings. They know because they're smart. These smart psychopaths can do this. They can see it. They can mimic it. They can draw people in. They're also constantly looking for excitement. So they're great people to be around. They usually have high levels of charm and charisma. So they draw, they draw people in and they're always doing exciting stuff. They're jumping out of airplanes, they're jet skiing, they're running around, they're doing cool stuff. That's why people like to be around them. And they like people around them because they want to use people and manipulate people. People are nothing more than the chair we're sitting on to them. And that's why the ones that decide to kill have no problem at all killing people because There's no human empathy. There's not an ounce of care for a person. All they want to do is get off on it for whatever, whichever way their particular psychology leans them towards. So they're missing the super ego then. Isn't that your conscience? Well, they're missing that and a lot of, a lot of other things. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, but some of them have a conscience, you know, and that's why they may end up being a CEO rather than a serial killer. But they don't have the capacity to actually form a a human bond with somebody else. They don't they just don't see it. They can't understand it. But they can mimic it if they're smart. (laughs) You know, you know, you you get your when you're speaking. I'm thinking of some of the serial killers I talk about in class. And I always talk to my students about the BTK killer out in uh, Kansas. Right. Because. uh, you know, and I, I use the term the banality of evil. Uh, mm. They applied it first to, you know, Adolf Eichmann. You know, um, he's a small guy. He looks like a clerk. He's just an everyday guy, not too tall. He looks like a monster and, predator, does he? Right. Not at all. He could be a janitor, you know, in a school somewhere or, or, or anything like that. Somebody picking up your, your garbage in the morning for the sanitation department. But he was interesting because... He was a criminal justice major in college for a while before he dropped out. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that the investigators thought the serial killer was. They thought he had some sort of law enforcement experience. Right. And it turns out he was a criminal justice major. And he was also uh, a uh, a compliance officer in Wichita where he'd go around and he could drive around. Control freak. Yeah. Control freak, right? He could drive around in a little car. Yeah. And just where where did you put your garbage? Did you have your commingles not mixed together properly? Has your grass grown more than two and a half inches high? You know, right. That's they, what he would do. Yeah, he yeah. loves that shit. And and that may have satisfied him for a yeah. while. And that's why he didn't kill for a long time. For like a, you know? almost a decade, I think. It was a real long time before. And then um he was he could drive around in his car and you saw him every single day. He just blended in with the scenery. 
Right. You didn't, you didn't even notice him after a while. He was not tall and intimidating. He was a local uh, Boy Scout troop leader for his son's troop. He was. He seemed to be, from what I could see from interviews with his daughter, a good dad in some ways. He did have some characteristics, like he was, he was sometimes you'd get old. into like certain moods. But they said generally he actually, they were, he wasn't uh, a control freak in terms of berating his children or mm. abusing them physically or emotionally. No, so, because, well, uh, you have to understand too, what Jim said earlier, like Israel Key's the guy that I worked with. He had an 11-year-old daughter at home and treated her very well. I had custody. Yeah. So full custody. They understand that they have to maintain, if they go crazy and they abuse this person and smack the yeah. wife and, and abuse the kid, authorities are going to come and get them. Right, they're it gonna, raises they're, their profile. Yeah, they're right. going to knock down that facade. They need to maintain that, and they get very good at it. They get so good at it, you don't recognize it as a facade, even if you're close to them. You yeah, really but I, real I, life. If you tell me that, that if she says that he wasn't, that he didn't have a list of rules, that he didn't have places where he wanted everything kept, mm -hmm. he didn't have places that he didn't allow them to, to go. It was into some of that. Yeah. Well, there must've yeah. been there. There had to have been, there's no way yeah. he could have kept that out of his personality because it's so, I mean, the whole thing, BTK. I mean, he named himself. Right. Bind, torture, kill. Bind was an important part of that. He didn't just say torture, kill bind. I mean that, you know, the symmetry of their bindings, all that stuff, you know, in bondage and so forth, all that stuff has to do with control. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, it just it kills me to know that, you know, that how successful he was yes. um, at, at being that person. But so do you teach at John Jay? No, I teach at Albertus Magnus up in uh, oh, New Haven. Uh, in New Haven? Yeah. Albertus Magnus. College. College. Oh, yeah. well, I know there was a high school, Albertus Magnus. Yeah. Um, right here in Rockland County. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I didn't know there was a college. Wow. Yeah. OK, cool. Well, you know, if you want me to come on and guess, be a Zoom, I'll, I'll talk no. to your class. I'll you take you up on that. Guys, I have to go to a quick commercial, and I'll be right back. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, real crime stories. If you like real crime or true crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and give us a thumbs up. If you want to contribute to us financially, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also, you want to be a YouTube channel member. You can see the folks in the green font. We have five different levels of YouTube channel memberships. You see the fantastic guests we have on the show tonight. And we're going to, our, our aim is to bring you more of this. Anyway, if you're not subscribed, go subscribe on us. Guys, I, you know, we've been here for an hour and 17 minutes and it feels like 10 minutes. It's, it's unbelievable. Right. But yeah. I know Bobby wants to dive into the ocean right now and <laughs> dive, for, dive for some pearls. <laughs> I don't want to keep you guys this long, but this has been unbelievable. It's 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 just fantastic. It's been and, uh, it's been fun talking to some real cops. Thank you. You know we love we love that. Uh, you know I miss New York. Um, yeah, I went I went to Fordham, you know, in the Bronx, and then I went to Fordham Law School, Lincoln Center, and uh, you know I I just I miss. Jim Dad was a he was a lawyer for what fifty years in Manhattan. Lived in yeah. Manhattan his whole life almost. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my dad. Yeah. You know, except for the last few years, uh, he lived in in the city. He was born in the Bronx in a taxi cab on the way to the hospital. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he was true to the Bronx, you know, and every every now and then somebody asked me, you know, Yankees or Mets. And I'm like, well, what's the Mets? <laughs> what's the Mets? <laughs> Let's get serious. Let's get serious. But anyway. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, Bobby. It's always great to see thanks, you. Man. And wait, before you know, I go, Bobby, I want to I, I want to show you something that I found today. Oh this no! Is, this is one of the memory boards of, of Bobby's. Oh, I don't is know that, all, can... that like one of my collages? Yeah, of 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 his appearances on uh, Fox on TV. News I don't know that. if you can wow. see that. Wait, let me get Jim, this out of the way. And then Jim's wait, brother used to have a production company. Well, still do, but uh, COVID. Did, oh, what is that one? And this oh. is uh, you with. Uh... Oh, that's Gary, my buddy Gary Sinise. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I worked two seasons with Gary on a spinoff of Criminal Minds. Um, yeah. And so I was on his, uh, his tech advisor on set. So I taught him how to hold a gun and how to handcuff somebody. And, and, and Gary and I became best of friends. We still talk once a week or twice a week. 
he, he moved out of LA now he's in Nashville, but, um, but a great guy. And I really enjoyed, that was one of the highlights of, uh, you know, I have Jim to thank about that. And then when that show went off, Jim brought me over back over to the main criminal minds, uh, powerhouse and, and we wrote uh, some, uh, three, episodes three, together yeah we wrote are you, a couple are, are you guys getting food stamps now that you're uh you're unemployed because of the writer's strike or what dude i i, I think i'm gonna have to sign up uh it, <laughs> i'm telling you it's it's brutal and these companies you know they're making hundreds of billions of dollars together and you know we're asking for a tiny little you know like they showed the percentages that we're looking for like 0.014 yeah. or 0.008 of of the budget that they have, you know, and it's just, so we're negotiating with a group of 10, 10 studios, right. And the 10 heads of those studios collectively last year made $400 million in salaries, just those 10 people. So they made an average of $40 million each. If uh, there's a writer's, there's a thing out and it's very transparent. It's out on the internet. If they acceded to every one of our demands, it would cost them $19 million. Every one of our demands, if they just gave us everything we wanted, it would cost them 19 million. They averaged 40 million a year, each of the 10 each heads person. of the studios. Yeah, it's, so, a, it's you know. Anyway, it's, what hey, I, they're all si they're all serial killers. <laughs> <laughs> it's all psych it's a, a psychopathy, right? Well, they're all, they're all episodes of Criminal Minds, yeah. and, and almost every one of those episodes came out of Jim Jim's mind and Jim's experience and 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 his career and. It's a, it, you know, that show would not have been successful if it wasn't based on reality and, and the things that Jim uh, experienced in his career. And, and well, what's really cool about it is that, you know, since COVID happened, a whole new generation of kids watched it on Netflix. And, you know, and it stands the test of time because we didn't just let them do the goofy things that you see on East New right, York right. Or, or one of these other shows that it's just like. Like Bobby and I just talked about it because that show actually bumped us out of a place where we, we had an were. NYPD show that we were developing and, and it was going to be great. And the network liked it. Everybody in the industry thought our show was better than East New York. And it was it was going to be a great show. It was NYPD. That but it they was wanted a golf a NYPD show and a, and a backroom deal at the last minute yeah. on a golf course. Some executive friend of another friend. They told us we had it. We had the time slot. We were going to move forward. And we we, we we wrote the show and it was going to be great. And East New York beat us out on a BS friendship backroom deal. And we knew it wasn't going to be a good show because, you know, we knew that script and we knew at least the pilot we knew. And and, and we were like, no. Yeah, they, had, they had some good actors. It wasn't the acting. It was the fact oh. that the people who wrote it knew nothing about being a cop. And, right, right, you know, right. we proved over and over again. Like one year I did. I was doing Criminal Minds, and then I did the spinoff of Criminal Minds, the pilot. I helped on that. Uh, the the um, what is it? the Blind Spot pilot and the Quantico pilot, and all three of those pilots got picked up, and all three of those series went multiple seasons because they were real and people liked right, that, right. you know. Absolutely. And so yeah. you know, I mean, I just wish the executives would. The problem is, the truth is. The executives are getting younger and younger and younger and they just don't have any life experience and they right. just think that what they saw on tv before is just reality so anything anything seems good to them but you know bobby I mean, and i really had to struggle with some people i mean the worst them. part of it is they not only do they not have a life experience they actually devalue people like us because they see us as a threat like they don't want old timers who have experience coming in because that kind of undermines their whole existence because they're younger. They haven't done much in their career, but they're at a point where they're, they're making decisions and we've actually been devalued, you know, and, and they would rather like, uh, look, I tried last year to get on any one of Dick Wolf's three FBI shows and were told they wouldn't hire me. Um, you know, you're, and a head yeah. big. you're a head big. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I, I could, I could give you five seasons of episode ideas over lunch and you're right. going to have, these kids coming out of an MFA program struggling to come up with an episode idea because they just don't know what they know is what they've seen before. So they're going to regurgitate 
something they've seen before. You're going to get the old tropes. You're going to get, you know, the stupid FBI tropes that everybody knows don't exist anymore, you know, and, and, and the shows are going to suffer for it, but they don't care because Dick Wolf's going to make a billion dollars. anyway. Right. And, you know, Bobby and I were on a show, we won't say the name of it, um, where we spent, you know, we wrote 10 episodes as a group, you know, uh, the, these writers and, you know, some of them really listened to us and some of them literally did everything exactly the opposite of what we said yeah, like they literally sense. made it made a point and you know we said this is this is ridiculous this is illegal this is not how it's done this is completely goofy and they'll say well i saw it in a movie once or i read it in a book once or i saw it on on a show and great so if you saw it on a show then you're copying something that's wrong don't right, do it right. we'll tell you the truth I'll tell you how young the room was. I, I we were doing a scene, or we were kind of working through a scene, and we wanted our guy, our good guys, to look good. And I said to my, I said, well, we don't want them to do that because they look like the Keystone Cops. And then I, I, I turned to my buddy and I, I felt silence in the other room. And and the guy next to me was an old timer. He wrote on Lost and stuff. And then they were all staring at me, like four or five stares. And he leans over to me, goes. They don't know who the Keystone Cops were. They don't know. Who the <laughs> <were>. <laughs> you should have shown them this picture. They would have been yeah. terrified. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but I'm like, you're dealing with people who don't understand the reference when you say they're going to look like the Keystone Cops. I'm like, oh my god, like what are you? Like who are these people? Like, I don't. I that used really to happen to me when I taught college. I used the term dungarees. And they, yeah. were, they were like, what the hell are dungarees? And I was like, oh, I, I'll give you that. I haven't heard that term in many years. Yeah, it's, it's sort of funny. Guys, I'm going to let you go. Right. I kept you way thank longer, you. but I want to thank you guys. are unbelievable. And you got to come back again. I, I know uh, I won't definitely. call you right away, but and, it, was, and it was amazing. We got to bring you Maureen O'Connell, too. She yeah, yeah. yeah we just speak, one of our other colleagues, Maureen O'Connell, I'll, I'll introduce your boss to her. She's, a, she's she a, a cop a cop. Person. And Everybody in her family is either a cop or a fireman. And Chicago. In Chicago, big, big yes. civil service Chicago family. Irish girl, very tough Irish. She's out here. Her, her husband's a cop, retired cop out here in L.A. I worked with her when we were on the job together here in L.A. She's she's a great she's guest. Great. And I'll bring her on. We'll come on together. And we'll she's really good at forensics, about. too. So Yeah, she was, she, she was a CSI person, yeah. That'd be excellent. All right, guys. guys great thank night. you, you thank very you so much. much guys. For thank you. Have a great Bobby. night. We'll talk right, to you soon. All right, thanks, Jim. Bye-bye.